Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. Hey, listen, I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer as we get into the Word of the Lord tonight. You guys ready to get into the Word of the Lord tonight? All right, I'm excited for that. I'm glad that a couple of us are. But listen, why don't we do this? Why don't we stand on our feet? Let's go before the Lord in prayer if you're able to stand. And I'm going to get down on my knees. Father, we come before you and we're just so grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here. God, we don't come to church to hear from a man or to hear from a woman, Lord. We don't come to hear from the old or the young or the black, the white, the brown, or anything like that. Lord, we truly come into this place to hear from you. It's not about what men have to say, but truly it is what about God, what God has to say. And so we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So it's in the name of Jesus we ask your Holy Spirit to be our counselor, to be our guidance, to be our, 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 our director tonight, Lord, that you would show us the things in the Word of God, that you would make things come alive for us tonight, that they would make sense in the Word of God, Lord, that I pray that it would be a seed, your Word, that would be planted into our hearts and into our lives, that would be the ground, and that we would cultivate that, and that seed would grow to bear much fruit in our lives. God, we thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us, and Lord, we don't ask these blessings just upon ourselves, but upon all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the world that are preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, at no time do we think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but rather we are co-laborers, truly brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So, Father, we thank you for all our local churches in the area. Lord, we ask that your hand would be upon them to bless them, to encourage them, to grow them as well. Lord, we thank you that we are all working together for your glory, for your kingdom, Lord, for your purpose. And with that, we say to the praise and glory and the honor to you be, and we say amen. amen. Praise God. Well, I'm excited. I think tonight's going to be a good night. I, I'm really encouraged by the word of the Lord as I was going before uh, God in prayer this whole weekend. You know, it's one of those things as a, as a preacher, it's always great when you know what you're going to talk about a week and so in advance, and it's always a little nerve-wracking when you have no clue. And this whole week, uh, Mondays and Tuesdays are, are, are my days, are, they're, they're what I would consider my weekend. My wife and I, we get to spend those time, and you know, I, usually during those days, I'm kind of in prayer, studying, thinking, and it's just like, man, God, where are we going with this? What are we doing? No clue. But today, this morning, as I was praying, and in my prayer, I came into the office just getting ready to study. And as I opened up the word of the Lord, man, it just jumped out. And I just said, oh, I got it. And the word of the Lord came on me. I'll tell you what, I'm excited. I'm just encouraged by what God has to say tonight. And I, I want to grab a hold of you tell you, you know, we got a lot of scripture that we're going to cover tonight. Because we're going to look at some stories out of the word of God. And we're going to look at some things and out of examples out of those stories. So there's going to be a lot of scriptures. But you know what? It's going to be good stuff. So I want to encourage you. Get your Bible. Out, let's get ready to go. Let's get encouraged for what God's got. And I tell you what, this journey that you and I are going to have tonight it's going to be an amazing journey. Tonight, I want to title the message simply this, World Changers. World Changers. You know, God has called you and I to be world changers. Now, we look at that, we think of that statement, world changers, as a great and big statement. Man, I want to get out there and I want to change the world. And yes, that is the goal. Yes, that is the purpose. Yes, that is the calling. But at the same time, have you ever heard something, somebody say, like, this is my world, or to me, my world? Oftentimes, our world isn't as big as the entire globe, but rather just that circle or that sphere of influence that we have in our own lives. Maybe it might be our family, our jobs, our workplace, or our, our schools, or whatever it might be. Our world changers. And tonight, we're going to look at some stories. We're going to look at some examples of people in the Bible that were world changers. That they changed the world around them, and in doing so, the glory of God was revealed. And ultimately, that's God's plan for our life. That we would change the world around us, so that the glory of God would be revealed. So today I want to look at some things. I want to present a thought. And, I, and, and the beautiful part about this is I love these kind of messages because ultimately if you guys don't get anything out of the word of the Lord, I get it. Because this is one of those things I would just tell you right off the front, right off the bat, I am preaching to myself tonight. Hallelujah. All right? So listen, just because you may not get I'm going to get it, okay? So listen, it's your choice whether you get it or not. So here's the question I want to ask you, and then I will give you a confession, okay? The question I want to ask is, are we, are you, am I, reactive or responsive? Reactive or responsive? You see, reaction. When something happens to us, when we react, reaction is oftentimes based out of emotion. Have you, ever, have you ever reacted? Have you maybe somebody got in your face or somebody said something or you got hurt or somebody said, you know, just something happened. Oftentimes a reaction puts you right on the defensive. You kind of get into that, well, listen, here, you know, and you kind of jump down. A response, 
on the other hand, is, is more of a logical, put-together, calculated thought. And when life comes at us, we have a decision whether or not we can react to life or we can respond to life. I love the terminology react versus response. You know, those who are in the, uh, the medical field or the police or fire department or, or EMT, they're not called first reactors, right? They're called first responders because reaction oftentimes is, is, is something based off the situation, but a response says, okay, I have been trained, I have been thought, I'm going to see the issue, I'm going to assess it, and I'm going to deal with it and move on. I love this statement. I heard it one time said before, we can either be thermostats or we can be thermometers. You think about that. That's such an amazing statement. We can either be a thermometer or a thermostat. Now you're like, Pastor Luke, what does that have? What, what are you talking about? You're talking about reactive? Were you talking about all these different thermostats, thermometers? Where are you going with this? Think about it. Think about it for a moment. The message is called World Changers. Now a, thermo a thermometer changes with the environment around it. Right? You put a thermometer in cold water and the temperature of the little mercury will go down or it'll go up. It'll change. But a thermostat, oh, praise God for thermostats. I tell you what, I love thermostats. I naturally, my, my, Pastor Deborah, my mom, we used to make fun of her as kids because she just ran cold. No matter what, it would be like 90 degrees. We had this big wood-burning stove. In, in our house up in Ukaipa, and it would just go bright red because the fire was burning, and mom would just be covered in blankets, and, and everybody else would be sweating in the house. I don't know what happened, but through, through the course of, of growing uh, uh, older in my years, I have become like her. I, don't, I, I was always a winter sports kind of guy. I loved the cold. I was always the guy that just couldn't stand the summer heat. And I don't know, I guess I just became Californiaized or something. Because now all of a sudden it's just like, I love the, thermos, the, the thermostat. My brother-in-law, I remember we were, one time we were driving up to the middle of the, the, the mountains in the wintertime. It was like 13 degrees and we were going to go, we were crazy. We were going to go fishing in this, in this cold temperature. And I just, he was sweating. I had my, temp, my thermostat in my car turned all the way up to hot and I had the heat just blasting and I was in heaven. And I look over and he just, <laughs> he's like cracking the window, like trying to sip the cold air. Because what a thermostat changes the environment around it, right? So a thermometer changes with the environment, but a thermostat changes the environment around it. So we have the decision in life. Listen, you, don't, you may not realize this. You and I have the decision in life whether or not we're going to change with the environment around us, we're, allow, we're going to react to the certain situations and things that life brings at us, or if we're going to respond, or if we're going to change the area or the environment around us. Because you see, this is biblical. God's desire for you and I is to be thermostats, to change the world. God's desire for us, His will, His plan for us, is to be world changers. It's biblical. That's why Jesus Christ says that you and I are salt and light. Why? Because we stand out. Because we are called to be world changers. So tonight I thought we'd have some fun. I thought what we would do to be to look at what it takes to be a world changer. You know, the beautiful thing about changing the world is it's not just a young man's vision. Changing the world is not just something that some young man with a vision or some young woman with a vision has. Changing your world can start at any moment in your life. All you simply have to do is begin responding instead of reacting. So it doesn't matter where you are, or where we are in our walks with life, at all ages, all, all walks of life, all levels of maturity, we are all called and we all have the capability of being world changers. So tonight I thought what we would do is look at four stories of people who were world changers and look to see what it takes to be a world changer. So I'm going to make the statement, being a world changer takes, and then we'll, we'll complete that. Complete that statement. So number one tonight in being a world changer. Being a world changer takes, number one, total trust in God. Total trust in God. Now, I use that word total, and you'll notice, I'm just going to give it away right now. You'll notice that all four points have the word total in front of them. Because this is like an all or nothing kind of thing. It takes total trust in God. You know, I remember in college when we were in business classes, there was a book that we had to read that uh, cataloged and kind of went through and did a study of some of the most successful and long-lasting businesses in America and around the world. 
And as we were reading this, this book about these, these companies that were successful and that were lasting, one of the authors pointed out something that was really, that was a common place between all of these companies, and that was the way that they had set goals. Now, the author went on to describe them as, in, in the business term, as what we would say is B-H-A-G. People are like, what is that? My wife, as I read that, as, as she was looking at this today, she said, I forgot what that was. What is that? It's, it's kind of a shocking statement, but that's because it's designed to be that way. B-H-A-G. All of these companies that are, are long-lasting and highly successful set these big, hairy, audacious goals. Crazy goals. I mean, totally out of the ordinary, so far beyond what everybody else around them was set. And that's what brought them above everybody else. That's what made them to be industry changers, is they had audacious goals. You see, in our lives, in order to be world changers, we have got to have audacious faith, audacious trust in God, so far beyond that everything we do is leaning on God and that there is no turning back, there is no plan B, there is no contingency, but everything we are is based on God. Total, total trust in God. Now, I told you we were going to look at some stories. Go with me to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, we're going to look at the life of a young man, later turns out to be King David's best friend, the king of uh, Israel, the first king of Israel, Saul, his son, Jonathan. In 1 Samuel, in the 14th chapter, we're going to kind of look through some things. 1 Samuel, in the 14th chapter, here the, the Israelites find themselves in a kind of a predicament. What happened is, is the Israelites and the Philistines... I've just never got along. It's the oldest freeway rivalry, rivalry in the world, all right? They just they didn't get along from day one. Even today, we still see all the conflict there. And what had happened is the Philistines had sent raiders out, and they took all the blacksmiths, they took all the metal workers out of Israel so that they couldn't forge weapons. So Israel finds themselves without weapons. They had to go to the Philistines to have their, their farm equipment sharpened and things like that. The, the, Palestines, uh, the Palestinians had sent uh, raiders out. So here the Israelites are out. They're camped around. They don't have any weapons. Jonathan is this young man. Remember, we were talking about these audacious goals, this audacious faith. Jonathan is this young man. He's this, this, the son of King Saul. He says to his armor bearer in, in, in the book of 1 Samuel 14, chapter, verse number 1, it says, Now it happened that one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come. Let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. There was this, there was this wall or these rocks that kind of covered where Israel was from Philistine, this natural uh, barrier. And Jonathan says to his armor bearer, "Go, come on, let's scale these rocks. Let's scale this wall and let's go over to the Philistines. So verse number two says, and Saul was sitting. Now this is what I were talking about. Look at this. Jonathan says, get up, let's get up and let's go to the Philistines. Look what it says. Saul was sitting under a pomegranate tree. Think about this for a moment. Oftentimes we want things to happen in life. Oftentimes we look around and say, man, why isn't anything happening? Why isn't anything coming my way? You see a reactor or somebody who lives a life of reaction looks at the world around them and says, well, why isn't anything going my way? Why can't I catch a big break? Why can't I find buried treasure or something in my backyard? Why is everything good always happen to somebody else? And we sit under a tree in the shade, waiting for opportunity to land on our face. But yet, there are those who are not reactive, but there are those who are responsive that say, you know what? I'm not going to wait for opportunity to someday, maybe by chance, land in my face. I'm going to get out there, and I'm going to seek after God. I'm going to have total faith in God, and I'm going to trust that opportunity is right now. You know, one of the things I get to do with the young adults is I get to, to minister and counsel with young adults. And the millennial generation has something that, that few generations, I don't think any generation beforehand, has ever seen. The millennials are growing up with a lack of work ethic. I don't want to get on a soapbox. I'm not trying to, to say this or trying to say that. But I got all the time people coming up to me and shift. Man, Pastor Luke, I just want to get to the top of the corporate ladder. Well, where do you work at? No, I don't want a job. Well, what about working, starting here and flipping hamburgers? No, man, that's not what I want to do for my, for my career. Dude, you got to start somewhere. You think somebody's going to call you up on the unemployment list and be like, hey, will you be the CEO of the next multi-billion dollar company? 
And so I start laying them out. What do you think about these, these guys, these dot-comers and this? And I name out the CEOs. What do you think about this guy? What do you think the Bill Gates and the Steve Jobs, what do you think that these guys did that was different? They didn't wait for opportunity to come their way. They went out there and they pioneered it. Let me tell you something, church. If it happens in the business world, if it happens in the tech world, if Donald Trump can be blessed, don't you know that you serve God Almighty and you can be blessed even more so with spiritual blessings? But we as Christians have got to get off our duff and get out there and do something in the world around us. The world's not going to change because we want it to. It's going to change because we get out there and have total trust and faith in God. So anyway, Saul is sitting underneath the pomegranate tree with the people who were with him were about 600 men. Going on, verse number three. Verse number, I'm skipping down to, okay, it says, and, and Ahiah, the son of Hatub, Echabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's police, priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod, but the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Verse number three says, Jonathan snuck out. He says, listen, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go cause trouble with the Philistines. Reckless, you might even say. He had a reckless faith. Skipping down now, Jonathan and his armor bearer, the God describes the, the area in which they crawl, crawl. Jonathan, his armor bearer, says to the young man who bar, bore his armor, come on, let's go over to the garrison, verse number six, to these uncircumcised. Look what Jonathan's attitude is. He says, it may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Jonathan, right off the bat, says, listen, we're going to go pick a fight with the Philistines. We don't even have weapons. Except for Jonathan had an armor bearer. The only ones that says in Israel that had weapons was Saul and Jonathan. So Jonathan says, let's go pick a fight with the, armor, or with the Philistines. It's not about us. It's not about our ability. It's not about our talent. A, re a reactive person says, oh, I need to do this. I need to do that. A, a responsive person, a thermostat Christian says, it's not about my ability. It's about God's ability. It's about Christ inside of me that I can get the job done. And so Jonathan says, it's about God who by many or by few will deliver us. So he says, goes on in his armor bearer, says, verse number seven, do that's in your heart. I'm with you. Let's go. Let's do this. Goes on to say, Jonathan says, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to climb this wall. We're going to scale the wall. We're going to see the Philistines. We're going to see if they come and say, oh, let's go to him. Then we'll fight. If they say, oh, hey, Jonathan, come here. Let us show you something. Let us talk to you. If they call us down off the wall, then we know that God has put them in our hands and we'll beat them. So they begin to scale the wall, looking down, skipping down into verse number 13. It says, Jonathan climbed up on his hands and his knees with his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan, the Philistines. Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees and the Philistines fell before Jonathan. As he came after him, his armor bearer killed him from behind. So Jonathan killed everybody coming at him from the front. His armor bearer was watching his back, getting everybody coming from behind. With that first slaughter with Jonathan and his armor bearer, it was about 20 men within a half acre of land. Look at this. Look, this, is, this is the amazing part. Verse number 15. And there was trembling in the camp of the Philistines, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison of the raiders were also, trem also trembled, and the earth quaked, so that it was a very great trembling. Here's two guys scaling a wall, saying, let's go pick a fight. Let's go do something about our situation. And now all of a sudden, the Philistine camp is trembling. The ones who came and took all the weapons are trembling. They're fleeing. The ground is shaking. They're so afraid because they did something about their situation. Those who were sitting in the shade under the pomegranate tree. It says now, verse 16, now the watchman of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and there was a multitude melting away. And they went here, and they went where? And there. Jonathan and his armor bearer, two guys, two young guys, scaled the wall on their hands and knees after the Philistines because the hand of God was on them, melted. The word melted away described the garrison, the legion of Philistines. And as the army that sat under the shade watched, they saw that everybody was trembling. The Bible goes on, the story goes on to say that the Israelites, they all got up and they started chasing after the Philistines. 
And then all of a sudden, the Israelites that were within the Philistine camp that had deserted the Israelite army, they started fighting against the Philistines. And then the people who, who were in the hills hiding came out of the hills, and they started fighting with the Philistines. And everybody chased the Philistines away. Why? Because two guys decided we're not going to be reactive in life, but whether we're going to respond, and we're going to get out there, and God's hand will be upon us because we have total audacious faith in God. Some might even say that Jonathan's faith was reckless. Listen, if we're going to do anything but put our faith wholly in God, it has to be reckless. It has to be reckless. It has to be all in. There is no plan B. You ever seen those like world poker tours or anything like that? These guys got big mounds of poker chips or whatever. You ever heard the phrase, I'm all in? Do you know what I'm all in means? It means I'm all in. No trick question. That means I have no plan B. It doesn't mean I don't have anything left in my, you know, you see the James Bond movie. The guy says, I'm all in. The other guy says, I'm all in. He says, no, 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 no. Pulls out the keys to his car. I'm all in. The guy pulls out his checkbook. I'm all in. They all start throwing everything they've got. That's how we've got to be with God. That's how we've got to be with our God. Hey, listen, church, we're all in. There's no plan B. There's no looking back. There's no wondering if this is the right or this is not the right. We're all in. We're sliding everything we've got in our life forward to God. We're saying, God, I've got big, audacious faith in you, and I'm going to change my world around me. First John in the fourth, fifth chapter, I'll put it up on the overhead. It says, whatever was born of God. Hey, listen, don't you know you and I are children of God, are born of God? Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. What? Our faith. Man, I'll tell you what. We can rest assured we serve a God that has overcome the world. I love this verse number five. It goes on and says, who is he who overcomes the world? Who? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. We've got to have audacious faith with God. We've got to have ridiculous, reckless faith in trusting in God. No plan B. Talking about being a world changer. Number two, being a world changer takes, number two, a total, total priority on his word. You see, I added that word total because it's not just a priority. A priority is great. Total priority means nothing else. Nothing before, nothing above. God's word has got to be priority in our life. Why? Think about it. If we're going to have audacious, if we're going to have reckless faith in, in the name of God in our life to change the world, how can we not have a total priority on his word that our faith is based on? So in order for us to have a total faith, a total trust in God, we have got to set his word that we base our lives on as a total priority in our lives. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in the here and the now that we forget to focus on what is priority. You know, I would describe myself as being a DIYer. Is there, anybody, is there any DIYers in the house? You know, for those of you that are professional tradesmen, uh, listen, I got much respect for you guys because DIYers, we just mess it up anyways. And then we call you when we're done. But, you know, I'm the kind of person, my wife, I always hear Pastor Luke always preaching from the pulpit of some home improvement project. I'm always at the hardware store. I mean, the people at the Home Depot know me by name. They're like, are you a pro customer? Psh, I don't even need to be a pro customer. I got a cot in the back. Every time I embark on a, on a home improvement project, I don't know if anybody's ever done this before. You, try, you say, I'm going to fix something. I'm going to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix that light bulb. All right. Paint that wall. Every time I do something in my house, every time it's a priority, man, I'm going to take my days off, it's important, I'm going to do this. I go to the hardware store like five times in that day. I get home, look at the bag, oh, I forgot, go back to the hardware store. Go, you know, and then what I do, because we have a Home Depot and we have a Lowe's like right next to each other, so you know what, I'm not going to go back to Home Depot because I'm embarrassed. I'm going to go to Lowe's. <laughs> every time I go to Home Depot, I try to, I'm, I'm going to buy a bucket of paint. We get so wrapped up in the here and the now. I'm, trying, I'm going there to buy paint to paint a room. I come back with a bag full of light bulbs. <laughs> My wife, we were, we were doing a backsplash at our kitchen. She sent me to go buy grout for the backsplash. I came back with everything from the hardware store except grout. <laughs> she was like, babe, where's the grout? Oh, man. Why? Because we get so wrapped up in the here and now. We get so wrapped up. You know, I'm going down the harbor, so I'm thinking, oh, man, I need lights. That light bulb was burned out. And then all of a sudden, it turns from that light bulb to this one switch that was loose, and it was driving me nuts. Oh, I need to go buy a new switch. And then I go over the switch and say, oh, you know, I can't find out where my wire strippers are. So I need to go get over it. I need to go over it. And then, I, you know, as a guy, I always just browse through the tool section anyways. So 
come home and I don't have anything else. We get so wrapped up in the here and now that we forget what we were there for. It's the same thing in our walk with God. We get so wrapped up in the situation right now that we forget about the priority. We forget about what's coming down the road. We forget about the long-term vision or the long-term goal. And we've got to realize and got to remember that it takes a total priority on God's word to be a world changer. Looking at the story, if you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Luke. Luke in the 10th chapter. Here's two women going from two guys that slaughtered a Philistine army. To, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. Let's go to two ladies who greatly affected our Lord and Savior, Jesus' life. Here's two women. Familiar story for us. Mary and Martha. Jesus is at the dinner. He's coming to dinner at their house. And Mary is at the feet of Jesus. Here he is sitting, teaching, preaching, telling the Word of God, the, the priorities on the Word. And then there's Martha, Mary's sister, in the kitchen, banging the pots and pans. You ever been there? You ever had somebody over there? Or you ever done this? Uh, you always have somebody. They always come over and they always just want to eat. You know, like they come to your house and you're like, man, I know why you're here right now. Because you are a mooch and you want my food. So here's Martha. She's in the kitchen. You can just see it. You can just visualize it. She's banging the pots and the pans. She's huffing and she's puffing. You know, you know, you all, you know have you ever done that? You open up the drawer or the, the, the cupboard. Oh, that's how it is for us every time we open it up. You open up the cupboard and all the pots fall out and makes that big old clang. Oh, oh, goodness. Oh. So here's Mary making all this commotion. Finally, she goes to Jesus. And the Bible says, she goes to Jesus and says, Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care? that I'm in the kitchen slaving for your dinner and my bum sister is sitting here at your feet ignoring her responsibilities. Sometimes we get so focused on the here and now that we look at God and we say, God, don't you care? God, I'm going through this. God, I'm frustrated. God, I got this thing going on. Where are you? Don't you care? But look what Jesus says. She says, Jesus, don't you care? Verse number 40, she was distracted with much service. Verse number 41, Jesus says to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things. But one thing, Jesus says, one thing, one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. It's not about what we've got to do. It's not about the, the task at hand. It's not about getting so distracted in what we're doing at this very moment that we lose sight of everything that is around us. Martha got so wrapped up that she missed what was important. That is the word of God as Jesus was teaching. Dwight Eisenhower said, What is important is seldom urgent. And what is urgent is seldom important. Think about that. Things here and now oftentimes have a way of taking, hey, 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 you got to answer, I got to know this, I got to know this, I got to fix this right now. When the big issue is down, it takes time, it takes a progression to get there. But we get so distracted that we lose track of what we're doing, we lose track of where we're going, we lose track of who we are. And then we wonder why our world's not changing around us. Martha got so wrapped up, you know, as a, as a child, I, I'm so grateful for my parents. They always set a priority for the Word of God. Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah are doing a great uh, parenting series. If you've got kids, you need to come on a Sunday night. If you don't have kids, you need to come on a Sunday night so you can tell everybody else who, doesn't have, who has kids how to raise their kids. I'm just kidding. That's not really the truth. <laughs> my parents always put a priority on the Word of God. They always would support my sister and I, my family and I, if we ever wanted to play sports, but there was always a standing rule. Some might judge it. Some might be critical. Some might say, well, I disagree with that. But my parents said you could always play sports as long as it never interfered with church. As a child, going my own, my own way, doing my own thing, I didn't pick the logical sport. I didn't pick football or soccer or baseball. I picked hockey in California, hockey. Go figure. My parents supported me in that, but they said as long as it doesn't interfere with church. Well, on the high school varsity team, believe it or not, our school had a hockey team. I know, California. Our practices were on Wednesday nights. Well, I could never make practices because Wednesday nights are services. So automatically, by default, because of my attendance record, I was bumped on the third and fourth string, which if anybody knows sports, when you're on the third and fourth string, you're like the guy that's out on the, on the rink to give everybody else who's good time to breathe. That's all I ever did was third and fourth string. But God blessed me in that 
because I honored my parents who honored the Word of God so much so that in my little hockey league, I was the leading scorer or one of the leading scorers in that league on my little 10-second run. Why? Because a total importance of God's Word has got to be above everything else. We don't have to come to church. We get to come to church. It has to be that way in our lives. Jesus answered in John the 14th chapter. I'll put it up on the overhead. If anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. And my Father will love him and will come and will make our home with him. Verse number 24 of John the 14th chapter says, He who does not love me does not keep my words. The words which you hear are not mine but are my Father's. Priority has got to be on the word of God in our life. Are you with me tonight? All right, so we're talking about being a world changer. It takes audacious faith, total trust in God. It takes priority. Number three tonight, it takes total peace during storms. It's going to take total peace during storms. Now, Californians, we're really good about peace during storms. Why? Because if it starts to sprinkle on your windshield, we go nuts. Storm watch 2014. Right? There's this weather system that we expect to roll in, and everybody's going bonkers like the sky is falling. All right? And these aren't even storms. I mean, I lived in Oklahoma. We saw houses gone after storms. All right? These are, this is just a sprinkle. But it takes total peace. We can't panic. I'm not talking about physical storms. I'm not talking about rain, guys. I'm talking about storms in our life. I'm talking about hardships. Things that are going to come, they're going to test our faith, they're going to test our lives. Storms. I love this. I, I, I'm a movie buff like that. It's totally inaccurate, not even close to the novel. But they had that movie a long time ago called The Count of Monte Cristo. Loved it. One of the, the quotes of the, of the, of the story is, is the Count says to the young man he rescued, he says, life is a storm. You'll bask in the sunlight one moment and be shattered on the rocks the next. What makes you a man, because he was speaking to a young man on his birthday, what makes you a man is what you do when the storm comes. Let me add this. What makes you a world changer is what you do when the storm comes. Because it's going to come whether you like it or not. Storms come whether we like it or not. There will be rough patches. There will be droughts. There will be famines in the land. But we can still change the world around us with the power of God by being responders rather than reactors. We are in the book of Luke. Let's turn a couple pages to the book of Mark. Mark in the fourth chapter. Mark in the fourth chapter. Mark in the fourth chapter, verse, starting in verse number 35. Jesus has been teaching. The crowd is with him, and he says, all right, let's cross. Let's go to this lake. Let's go over to the other side. So as Jesus says that, they all hop in the boat. They go across. And like Southern California, storm watch hits. Starts raining. The sea gets a little bit rough. The, the water gets, gets choppy. It gets dark. Rain is falling. Mark in the fourth chapter, the disciples are in the boat. Listen, Jesus is in the boat. Okay, you got to remember this. You got to remember this whole time. Jesus is in the boat. All right? Because look at what the disciple reactors do during the storm. Verse number 37 says, A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat. Listen to this. So that it was already filling. If you've ever been in a boat, when you have water in the boat, not a good thing. Pastor Jim had a sailboat one time. It had this deep bilge. For a while there, we called him Bilge. What was it? Jim Cobray, the Bilge Man, or something like that. Because him and Pastor Deborah, they went to Catalina on this boat. And, and there was a screw or something was loose. And so there was water. And Pastor Jim, he came back and said, I'm selling the boat. Because he said he spent the whole time with his head in the bilge pumping the water out. So here the disciples are freaking out because the storm is coming. The waves are beating so much so that the water is in the boat filling the boat up from the inside. Bad place to be. I love this. Verse number 38. But Jesus, he was on the stern in the back of the boat. Look at this. Look at this. A responder. Here is a responder in action, a world changer, if any, in action. During the storm, as the boat is on its way to sinking, here is Jesus asleep in the back on a pillow. Talk about responder. So he says, they say, he was asleep on the pillow, and they awoke him, said to him, Jesus, do you not care? There we see it again. 
that we are perishing, Jesus, we're going to die. God sent you to this world to redeem mankind, but your plan is going to be foiled because a storm arose. Oftentimes we think about this. Storms come our way, hardships come, and we say, God, don't you care? God, where are you? Don't you care? You gave me, you brought me here for a purpose, and now I'm facing a hardship. Where are you? When all along God said, hey, take a nap. It's okay. Get yourself a comfy pillow. Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey Jesus Christ? A storm calmer, a world changer. I read a quote that said this, when I am anxious, it's because I'm living in the future. When I'm depressed, it's because I'm living in the past. How many times, in my own sense, I said I'd follow with a confession. Oftentimes I would describe myself as a reactor, not a responder. The question I ask my own self is, how many times in my life have I wasted time worrying about what might happen rather than getting up like Jonathan, climbing the wall, and making something happen? We have got to have total peace in the storms. We have got to have total peace during the storms. Philippians in the fourth chapter. I'll just put it up on the overhead because we've got to move forward with time. Verse number six, those six says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. The New King James says, The peace of God that surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds. When we give it to God, when we've got total faith, total surrender, total reliance, total priority on His Word, when we give it to God and thank Him for all He's done in the midst of our storms, then peace that we can't even comprehend will guard our hearts and our minds. That supernatural peace is what makes you and I stand out from the rest. That is what makes people look at us and say, what is it about you that I don't have? Why are you not panicking? Why are you not freaking out in the situation? Why are you so calm? And you can say, I don't know, but God knows, and I've got God on my side, and I'm going to stay calm through this. Last one for tonight. I know I've taken up some of your time. Can we do one more? Handle one more? All right, this, is, this one's amazing. This one is really where it's at. Being a world changer takes, takes this, number four. Total praise in tribulation. Total praise in tribulation. Now, you might say, well, what's the difference between tribulation and storms? I like to use two similar words that sound much alike. Turbulence and tribulation. Turbulence is like the storms. It's what's happening around you in life. It's something that you come into. When you're in a plane, you fly into turbulence. It's there. It exists. It's your surrounding environment. Tribulation is brought on by decisions that you make. By following after Jesus Christ, by making a statement that you're going to war against the devil, tribulation finds its way towards you. Opposition, you could even go as far as to say, comes its way. So there's a distinct difference between storms, which are just what happens around you in the environment, versus tribulation, things that are brought on because of your decision to follow God. Looking at two great world changers. Paul and Silas in Acts, the 16th chapter. If you're there with me, go with me to the book of Acts in the 16th chapter. Really cool story. Really cool story. Acts in the 16th chapter. Paul gets a call to go to Macedonia. There, while he's at Philippi. And while he's there in Macedonia, in the, in the Greek region, Paul was out there. He was preaching. There was a young slave girl who was possessed by a spirit. And this young slave girl brought money to her owners because she would read people's fortunes. She would tell people's fortunes. So here's Paul the Apostle with Silas, and they're out, and they're ministering, they're teaching in the streets. And this slave girl has an assignment to buffet, come after Paul. And so as Paul is preaching, 
she says to Paul, or says to everybody around, listen to this man. He's of God. He knows what he's saying. Listen to this man. He speaks of God. He knows what he's saying. Hey, listen to this man. He, he's of God. He knows what he's saying. Let that be a sign. Totally different message. But here the enemy is coming to buffet and distract people by telling them to listen. Think about that for a moment. Totally different message. Can't even go there. But after a few days, as Paul is preaching, she's interrupting, she's shouting, listen to this guy. He knows what he's saying. He's of God. Paul finally turns around and he speaks to the spirit inside of the girl and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to get out of her. And the Bible tells us that that very hour, the demon that was in her was gone and she was relieved. Well, this presents a problem for her owners because their livelihood was made for her telling fortunes. So they take Paul and they take Silas and they drag them before the authorities and they say, these guys are out there, they're preaching things against our society that we can't do. They're causing ruckus, they're causing all sorts of problems. And then all of a sudden the people come around and they start to oppose Paul and Silas. So the authorities they take and they strip Paul and Silas down and they beat them with rods. Hello, tribulation. You know, they say sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. All right, so they've got words against them, and they got sticks. All right, they've been beaten with rods. Now the Bible says that the magistrates, the authorities, take Paul and Silas, and they throw them into prison. But it gives us a little extra. It says that they throw them in the inner part of the prison, like solitary confinement. Now, let's think about this. 2,000 years ago, the prison system isn't what we have today. I can honestly say I don't think there's anybody that would willfully want to go to prison in our day and age. Imagine now well, a prison system without cafeterias, without outside time, without running water or, or toilets, with shackles on your feet on dirt, where you lived or where you were shackled. Think about it. It's where you had to do your business. Not a pleasant place. Acts in the 16th chapter, starting in verse number 25, at midnight. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Look at that. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. This is it. This is it. See, reactive versus responsive. Reactive, Pastor Luke would have been in that prison and be like, Oh, God, why me? Why nobody knows the trouble I've seen? <laughs> right? That's reactive. Paul and Silas at midnight in the darkest, well, innermost part of the prison, in the stench of where they were at in their presence, having been beat open with rods, are praying and singing hymns to God, responding to the situation that they're in, to the tribulation. And look what this is. This is very important. I want you to grab a hold of this. I need you to grab a hold of this. It says, and the prisoners were listening to them. What was the title of the message today? World Changers. The prisoners were listening to them. Look at verse number 26. Paul and Silas are praying and singing. Suddenly, I love suddenlies in the Bible. Suddenlies are great. Suddenly the earth swallowed them. Suddenly this happens. Suddenly, it's so wonderful. You just know when you see suddenly, it's going to be good. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. So the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were open. And everyone's chains were loosed. Do you notice how it says Paul and Silas' chains were loosed? Did you notice how it said that only Paul's chains were loosed? Everyone's chains were loosed. Okay, now look, look, okay, listen. There's, there was a TV show called Prison Break, right? If you're in prison, some of you in San Bernardino, you know this a little bit. If you're in prison, pretty much the things that consume your thought are how do I get out, right? So here's this great earthquake, walls are shaking, your door busts open, falls off, and all of a sudden, think about it, think about it, your chain, you've got handcuffs on. They're not even attached to the ground. You've got handcuffs on, and the earth shakes so much that all of a sudden, your handcuffs fall out. To me, divine sign for run, right? <laughs> this is God saying, get the heck out. All of their chains were loose. Verse number 27, look at this, look at this. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, seeing that the prison doors were open, supposing that everybody had fled, because that's what common sense would do, right? Drew his sword. He was about to kill himself. He was about to wrap it up. He was about to be done with it. Verse number 28. Paul called with a loud voice. He said, do yourself no harm, because everybody else split, but Silas and I are here. Is that what it says? 
Do yourself no harm, because I'm still with you. I got your back. No, do yourself no harm. Why? For we are all here. Wait a minute. Okay, remember, I made a confession. I'm a reactive person. Praise God, you're singing hymns. I'm out. All right? He says, we're all here. We're all here. Verse number 29. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He goes on to say, then he says, what must I do to be saved? How do I serve this God that just did this for you? How do I serve this? You see, Paul and Silas were world changers. What the Holy Spirit was doing was setting that entire prison up for the miraculous conversion of the jailer and his family. The Bible says that he and his family, the jailer took Paul and Silas, he took them and washed their wounds, and their family, he and his family were immediately baptized. You see, because Paul and Silas were responsive. They were being thermostats in their situation, saying, you know what, this is a lousy place to be. This is a lousy time, but I'm going to pray, and I'm going to sing good songs to God. And everybody was listening, and so the Holy Spirit was setting that up so that when their chains fell off and logic would say to run, they said, no, there's a God that did this, and we want to stick around and see what these world changers are going to do next. I was telling some of the young adults, because, you know, we're talking about love in our, in our young adult series. And with the subject of love comes the subject of things that follow love. And those are sometimes hard subjects, especially with young adults, you know, things of purity and stuff like that. And we were talking about them. We said, you know, the word of God is going to rub you. You stick around long enough. The word of God is going to rub your flesh wrong at some point. Proof. Here it is. James, the first chapter, verse number two. He says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Rub the flesh the wrong way. James is saying, hey, be responsive when you come into trials. Be responsive when you come into trials. For the testing of your faith produces patience. Jesus, on his Sermon on the Mount, talking to the disciples, talking to you and I thousands of years later, says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you for all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Why? Rejoice! And be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Rubs the flesh the wrong way. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The book of Acts, Acts tells us in the fifth chapter that the disciples went away. So they, dis they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Rejoicing in tribulation. The world's not going to change, church, unless we become responders. Unless we make the conscious decision to look at the circumstances around us, to look at the long-term goal, to look at the long-term uh, vision of our life that God has set before us, and make the decision, am I going to be like a thermometer and react to everything that comes my way, or am I going to be like a thermostat that God has ordained me, anointed me to be in my world, and to change the world around me? Listen, your world may be big or your world may be small. However big or small it is, God's desire, God's plan, God's anointing, God's ordination for your life is to get out there and to change your world, however big and however small it might be. Now, your world, however big and however small it might be, doesn't affect the global world. But let me say this, that when your world changes, the 10 or 15 people that you know because of your response, and when the person sitting next to you's world begins to change, and the person behind you's world begins to change, and the person in front of you's world begins to change, and the person on the other side of the world gets into the things of God, and their little world begins to change, and the person on the other side of the globe from them, world begins to change. All of a sudden, exponentially, we begin to see the world, the physical globe that we live on, change for the glory of God, because each and every one of us started with our circle of influence in the world that we live and we can be world changers, not in just the global sense, but in our own personal world. And in doing so, we will change the world globally for the glory of Jesus Christ. But we have got to make the decision to stop reacting and start responding. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? Hey, listen, I want to do one more thing tonight. 
please don't get up, please don't walk around. Here's why. I want to just ask you to remain respectful for what God's about to do, as you see. It's very important that we give you the opportunity to examine your heart, to examine your life, where you stand with God. Because if you were to leave tonight and you were to die, and you're not sure where you're at, or you were in the wrong place or the wrong situation with God, it would be a travesty for us to not give you that opportunity. And I don't ever want to stand before God and have your weight, or the weight of your eternal life on my shoulders because I didn't give you the opportunity. So listen up. Please don't walk around. Give me a moment more of your attention. Simply put, what makes you think you're going to get to heaven? What makes you so sure? The worst thing you and I can do is we can live a life thinking that everything's okay, thinking that we're great with God, thinking that we're good with God, and realize and come to find out at the end of our lives that that was never the case. Oftentimes what happens is we live our life on preconceived notions. We think that we can get into heaven because we want to. We hope so. We have a desire to, or I, I think I am. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can want, hope, think, or desire your way into heaven? You're not going to get there because you want to. Oftentimes in America, especially, we think that we're going to go to heaven because we go to church, because you're here tonight, because you know who Jesus is, because you were baptized or christened as a baby, or maybe you went to catechism or Sunday school classes as a, ba as a child, attended youth group or children's church. Listen, let me respect you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to get to heaven because you sit in church. You're not going to go to heaven because you were, went to Sunday school or catechism classes or because you were baptized or christened. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're going to get into heaven in any of those ways, yet so many people hold on to that as, that, that, as though that's the way we're going to get it there. Listen, it's not about the outward appearance. It's not about how good you and I are, whether or not you've robbed the 7-Eleven or you haven't, whether or not you've remained pure or good your entire life. The Bible says that no matter how good we are, our good deeds to God and His righteousness are like filthy rags. Nothing we could ever do would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. So it's not about your wants. It's not about your desire, your hopes. It's not about what your parents told you. It's not about whether or not you sit in a church service. It's not about whether you do good deeds or give to the Red Cross. You see, it's God's heaven. The only way for you and I to get into God's heaven is God's way. And God's way is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said that He is the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody, listen, nobody goes to the Father except through Him. So today, let's not try any other way but God's way. Jesus Christ, as He was speaking to a religious leader, John, the third chapter, a man by the name of Nicodemus, so, talking about the subject of eternal life. You would think that Jesus, in talking to Nicodemus, a religious leader, would say to Nicodemus, man, you just keep doing what you're doing. Keep going the path that you're doing. Pat him on the back and say, man, yeah, you're on the right way. Jesus says to Nicodemus, a man who taught in the synagogue, the church of his time, a man who memorized the scriptures of God, a man who prayed, a man who gave to the poor, who did all the good things that you could think of, who wore the right clothes. Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now our culture, our society has made quite a mockery out of that. When you think of that, you hear that, you think of radical, crazy, weirdo, out of control Christianity. Listen, let me tell you, I don't care what society's defined it as or popular culture. I don't care what sitcoms make of it. Born again does not mean what Hollywood says. They have no concept of God. Why would we ever define something so permanent, so important in our lives by something that is so ever-changing? Society always is changing. The only constant in our life is God and the Word of God. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ said that we must be born again. What does that mean? Shed your thoughts. Get over those, those thoughts that you might have. Born again simply means this. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. You see, it's an all-or-nothing relationship with God. It's not about your mental ascent towards Him or your carnal knowledge of who He is. Listen, we already know that you know who Jesus is. That's why you're here tonight. But the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who Jesus is, but yet they're not on their way to heaven. Why? Because there's more than just knowledge. It's about giving Him all of your heart. It's about giving Him all of your life. It's about surrendering today, like we talked about, total faith in God. No plan B. All in for God. Let me prove it to you in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the churches. Listen, not to the Gnostics, not to the world, not to the people outside of the church. Jesus is speaking to the church, people like you and I. And Jesus says he's going to come back. And when he comes back, he better find us hot or he better find us cold. Because if he finds us, the church, lukewarm, he will vomit us from his mouth. Whoa! Shocking statement. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. And will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. What does lukewarm mean? Simply put, come on, let's define this real in, in today's terms. Lukewarm simply means that you're a little bit in, a little bit out, a little bit up, a little bit down, half in, half out, not wholehearted for God, not wholehearted against God. Listen, 
half a relationship won't get you anywhere in life. If you're married, if you look at your wife or you look at your husband and you only gave them half of your love, or if you only raise your children with half of your effort, or in your businesses you only gave half of the effort that you should, in a friendship you only did a little bit here, a little bit there when it was convenient for you, you know full well as well as I that none of those relationships would be successful or succeed in life. Yet why do we think that we can treat God with so little effort and that we're going to get everything back in return? When God says, I want you to be sold out. I want you to give it all or nothing. I want you to make me the entire Lord. I want you to make me the ruler of your life. The decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or make his way. It's your choice. God gave you. You were born with a free will decision because he would never violate your right to choose. Oftentimes I hear people say, well, I have a hard time believing in God who would make it his business to condemn people to hell. Jesus said in John the third chapter that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believed would have everlasting life would not perish. He goes on to say he did not come to condemn. God's not in the business of condemning men to hell. He's in the business of redeeming us to heaven. But it is our free will choice to choose God. It's your choice today. Today I want to give you the opportunity to make that choice, to make that decision. You see, Jesus Christ said that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. But if you deny him, he'll deny you. Today I want to give you the free will choice all across this auditorium. And here's what I'm going to do. And in a moment I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three I'm going to go three. Smack my hands together real loud. Bang! Just like that. And if that's you in this place, I want to give you the opportunity. What I want to ask you to do is I want to ask you to be bold. And when I count to three, I'm going to smack my hands together. Bang! Just like that. What I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to today give him all my life. I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. You say, Pastor Luke, I don't know if I'll be able to raise my hand. I think I'm going to be embarrassed. Listen, come on. Don't be embarrassed about the best decision that you'll ever make. This is the best decision as a human being you can ever make. Far beyond who you choose to marry or the business decision you choose to get into, this is the absolute best decision you can ever make. Don't ever let a moment of embarrassment or a stupid, irrational feeling get in the way of the best decision you can make. It's your choice today. God has already done everything he could to ensure your place in heaven by giving Jesus Christ to die, a beaten, bloody mess on a cross, naked for the world to see for your sin and my shame so that we can be free of that by giving it to Jesus Christ so that we can live a life free of sin and shame and go forward in our relationship with God and be assured of our eternity with him in heaven. Who should raise their hands in just a moment if you've never given him your heart, you've never given him your life in just a moment? When I count to three, pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. If you're not sure, in just a moment, when I count to three, maybe you did this as a kid or in a youth group or a Billy Graham or Harvest Crusade, if that, that's you in just a moment, hey, don't walk out of this place without making sure. You don't know when tomorrow, what tomorrow holds, or whether or not we're even here tomorrow. Don't wait another day. This is your moment. This is your time. Who should raise your hands if you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing? In just a moment, if that's you, get ready. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it and put it right back down. We'll go forward from there. Today is a day of your salvation. Whether you think it's real or not, come on. Heaven's a real place. Hell's a real place. Real enough for God to speak about it. Jesus Christ to teach us about it. It's real enough for you and I to stop playing games and realize that it's something for us to take serious. It's your choice. Your call. Between you and God and you and God alone. So the decision is yours. I'm going to count to three in just a moment. Whether you're in the front row or the back row. Listen, whether you're over there in the family rooms on either side, if that's you. If you're watching by television in the foyer or hear the voice of my, the sound of my voice around this campus. If that's you, this is the moment of your salvation. Don't waste another moment. Get ready. This is your moment. This is your time. I'm going to count to three. When I count to three, get ready. Pop your hands up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. We'll move forward from there. Here we go. Ready? One, two. Three. Let me see your hands in this place today. One, two, three. I see you guys right there. Three wise people. Anybody else? Where are you guys at in this place today? Three wise people. I got you, my man. I got you guys back in there. Three wise people. Anybody else today in the family room? In the back? Oh, come on. Three. One in the family room? All right. Four. Four wise people. Where are you guys at? Listen, I know there's more than four people in this place. I can feel you by the Spirit of God. I'm not going to make you. I can't force you. You know, you might even say, Pastor Luke, I feel like you're rubbing me wrong. I see a hand pointing this way. Four wise people. Pastor Luke, you're rubbing me wrong. Listen, let me tell you something. The devil is rubbing you wrong to keep you, keep your hand down. I love you enough. I respect you enough to get in your face, to be truthful about it so that you make the decision. Come on. If that's you in this place, your choice. Four wise people, five wise people. Anybody else in this place today? If that's you in this place, come on, get your hand up so I can see it. Let's go forward. This is your moment. This is your time. Anybody else in this place today? I'm going to close it up. Four or five wise people. Anybody else? 
Well, praise God for the four or five wise people. I can sense, I can feel by the Spirit of God. There's more of you in this place. Say, man, I was me. I should have done it. I missed out. Come on. Listen, here's what we're going to do. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You say, I want to do it by raising my hand. You get saved by making Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. The Bible says in the book of Romans that if you confess him with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord and raised from the dead, you shall be saved. In just a moment, we're all going to stand. If you raise your hand and you're serious about this, whether you're in the family room, whether you're in the back row or the front row, wherever you're at, you're serious about doing this. In a moment, we're all going to stand together. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, your friend, your kids, your family. Somebody came with you or you brought somebody, bring them all with you. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. The ushers will help you out of the family room. Get in the aisle and come meet me here at the altar. And we're going to change destinies together. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know that I was talking to you. The Spirit of God speaking to you. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. It's not about me. It's about you and God. Stop ignoring God. Stop playing games with God. If that's you, when we all stand, I want you to get your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, your friend if you need a friend. Get out of your chair and come meet me at the altar. And let's change destinies together. Come on, let's stand together. Please, nobody leave at this time. If you raise your hand from the front to the back, come on. If that's you, let's change destinies. Destinies together right now. guys, look it. Everybody's up here with your head down. Knock the shame off. You know why? You're not going to a, a funeral, all right? You're going to a birthday celebration. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Good decision, guys. Good decision, all right? This is a good day. Give me some knuckles. I want it. Give it to me. All right, come on, guys. Listen, here's what we're going to do. See this guy right over here? This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really cool guy. What he's going to do, he's going to take you right over there. All right, listen, nothing weird goes on. I promise. I'm as weird as it gets. He got through me, okay? He's going to take you right over there. He's going to pray with you. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. We're going to pray a prayer to do that, okay? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free literature, all right? You're going to walk out of this place and say, oh my goodness, now what? We're going to point you in the, re in the right direction, real easy to read, help you get strong, help you point you in the right direction so you get off on the right foot. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. Hey, we give away friends here at the church. They're called spiritual personal trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer. They make sure that you're not wasting your time on all that equipment. You have no clue how to use. Make sure they're spotting you and stuff like that. A spiritual personal trainer is like that. They're going to come alongside of you, teach you some things in the Word of God, and get you a cup of coffee before church come a couple minutes early. Sit down with them. They'll get you a cup of coffee, teach you for five weeks some principles of the Word of God to get you strong like a personal trainer would so that you don't go back to the life that you came from, but you're victorious and change the world around you. So if you guys just turn to your left, my right, right over there with Pastor Joel. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent Him for me and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. 
Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.